inside on this stage, we're going to be welcoming up, welcoming up uh, Romain, our CEO at Gorgeous. He's, this is uh, going to be the, the, uh, the presentation for today from, from our CEO. We're going to be talking about the future of e-commerce. Um, and Romain has flown in from San Francisco just to be here with this afternoon. So uh, I'm going to pass the, sta the mic over to Romain and uh, take it away. Thanks. Woo! <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. Really great to uh, see you in person. Thanks so much for coming over here to, to our event. Uh, so yeah, thanks, uh, Michael, for the intro. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, how to succeed in the next decade of, uh, of e-commerce. And essentially, the story of uh, preparing this talk was uh, started in LA. So I think a couple months ago, we were here uh, with a couple of folks from the team. And what we did is that we went on a merchant tour to speak with uh, about like 25 of you and ask you about like, hey, like, what is it that you're going to do the next 10 years to adjust to what's changing? And uh, we computed some of the learnings that uh, I'm here to, to share today. So there we go. Um, so I'll start with uh, a little bit of like the lay of the land, like what happened the, the last couple of years. So essentially, like we got great at acquisition. Everybody started getting into uh, e-commerce. So you can see here, like in the US, like what are the different like age uh, groups and their usage of e-commerce. And overall, like we have like about like 25, 30% people more uh, buying online. And so that's great because these people are on your Clavio lists or they like know your brand. And so you already have like a little, the beginning of a relationship that has been built with these customers. And that's something that uh, we can all leverage. Uh, so with that being said, that's the curve of like the, the adoption of uh, e-commerce versus retail. So we can see that we're still doing like much better than, uh, than pre-COVID, even though like there was this big spike, obviously. Um, but uh, I think there are a few clouds on the, uh, the horizon that we need to, to talk about. So let's talk about them. Essentially, the high level is that the, the recipe that's based on like a lot of budget on the acquisition side doesn't work as well as before. So if we look at uh, numbers, we love numbers at Gorgias, so we, I, I like to share a few. Uh, so, so there are a, a few things you can see on the slide. So the, these are the, the, the CPMs on ads, and like overall, it's like up plus 60% roughly. So that means like when you look at uh, a DTC brand versus the more traditional retailer like uh, Procter & Gamble, you see that essentially where the budget goes as a, as a retailer is that, uh, sorry, as a DTC brand is that most of it goes to marketing. And so that means when your marketing cost goes up like 60%, then you need to like work on all the sides of the equation. So we're going to talk about like how to optimize your equation given like some of the parameters have changed. The I think the meta learning here is that DTC has been rising like in the last decade, and uh, it's been wonderful to to watch and see some of your success stories, and uh, and quite impressive to be honest. And so I'm pretty excited uh, to. Uh, essentially like participate in this next decade that's opening up with like a whole bunch of new challenges that are going to be ahead of us and how we're going to like all together invent like what are the solutions to uh, th strive as a brand over this next decade. So I, I think th there are probably going to be a few things that are going to change. Uh, I want to talk about one of them, which is the fact that we need to go from a model that's like very transactional. Hey, like you see uh, an ad, you click on it, you buy, and then like you move on versus uh, something that's more about building a relationship with customers and keeping these customers around for a long time by building this long-term relationship. So I'll start with uh, a few beliefs uh, that we've built based on these, uh, these conversations. Um, and those are essentially like based from learnings from merchants. So one of the first ones is that um, when you speak with, I mean, all of us, we, we customers, like we buy from brands. And when you speak with people who buy from brands, like typically they want to buy uh, things from brands that they believe in. So brands that stand for uh, what they care about. So it's a bit like voting with your, with your wallet. And um, we, we see a lot of successful brands on, uh, uh, in the ecosystem um, doing exactly that. So for example, like you have like Pella case here that, that makes uh, uh, sustainable phone cases. And uh, essentially, like they talk about it throughout the whole journey. And another one is Brewmate, one of our customers uh, at Gorgeous, uh, who makes, again, like sustainable coolers. Like you have like the whole story of like why their product is sustainable at every touch point of the customer journey. So I think what they do really well here is that they essentially express very clearly what is it that they stand for, and that allows them to connect well with the end customers. So that's the first belief. Second one is uh, 
more on the on the data side, like this is the the stock of uh, two of the the most famous DTC companies. You have uh, All Birds uh, versus Figs, and both of them are great brands. Like personally, I, I, I love them and I really admire their their strategies. You can read a lot uh, about it in their like quarterly earnings and uh, and docs. And uh, what's really interesting about those two is like they're both like extremely innovative. But there's something that stands out since we had the the market correction six months ago is that now like. They used to be like roughly at the same level, but since then a lot has changed. And so I think what we can learn from Figs and All Birds is the fact that companies that retain their customers slightly better, you see like 60% retention for Figs versus 50 on All Birds, get a massive valuation boost. So that means your business is worth a whole lot more if you manage to build these relationships. So that's the second belief that we have. Um, another one, so speaking uh, about uh, the best practices from uh, Figs, so uh, after speaking with, uh, with Michael, who leads the, the CX department here, uh, one thing that's particularly interesting about this is that uh, they're not just here like, hey, we have this belief, we're going to launch this product and see how the sales are doing. What they've done is uh, something that I find really smart is that they have a whole loop of collecting feedback on, on the, the, the products from customers directly. So that means that every month what they do is that they're going to go through the, the Yodpo reviews or the Okendo reviews. They're going to go through the support tickets, through the NPS, like all that stuff. And then they're able to collect a bunch of customer feedback and then like say, hey, like, here are the, the three things that uh, our customers want this month. And obviously, like, you take this feedback, you act on it, then you get more feedback, and you create this cycle of like, getting better each, uh, each time. Uh, and so I found that pretty interesting, because essentially, like, typically, you have, like, we need reviews because we need to increase the conversion of the page, uh, which is great. But you probably also want to like, use that as a way to listen to your customers. And uh, if you want to build this relationship, obviously, you need to be attentive to their needs. Uh, so yeah, pretty smart idea here. And I think that's a belief that we can all uh, apply to, to our companies. Uh, another one I really liked, uh, this is from Waterfield Design. It's one of the uh, uh, SF merchants. They do cases for iPods, like all uh, Apple products. And uh, what's cool is that this is a a poor picture of their, their warehouse. Uh, but uh, what's really happening, interesting here is that this is where they manufacture the products and you have the designers sitting next to the people who manufacture the products. And so essentially, like, on a regular cadence, they have conversations about like, hey, like, how is it that we can uh, uh, improve our products? So that means that you have some people who collect the insights, uh, we saw this with figs, about how we can get better, but they also get all the employees at the same table to talk about like, how they can refine the, the products, refine the production, refine the customer experience, uh, which I think is also quite interesting, essentially to make sure that everybody has a, has a voice to improve the products. And um, I, was, uh, I was speaking with uh, uh, the, the, the CX leader at uh, Love Wellness just before that, and uh, she was mentioning that they also have this, like they have like everybody like essentially speak with customers so that they all form their opinions about like what is it that customers want, and once they have these opinions, then they can make informed decisions to improve the customer experience, the product, throughout the journey. So again, a, a good learning from uh, our friends at uh, Waterfield Design. Um, another belief we have is that Typically, we think a lot about like, what leads to conversion, but there is way more than that. Like, there is the first time you hear about the brand, like when you start like, the awareness process. Then there is like, what happens after the conversion. Like, is, when, when I open up my box, like, is it hard for me to use the product? Or do I need help? Uh, is it intuitive? Then there is, like, uh, let's say I'm at a, a party on Sunday and I'm talking about this product. Like, that's also like, the customer experience because I'm essentially passing my experience to somebody else. And so we want this experience to be good. Like when the customers talks about the brand, like they need to know like what they should talk about. So that's, that might be something you want to frame. Um, and then um, one last thing is like in the same re vein as the previous points, you also want to leverage these touch points to drive retention and uh, in the future revenue. So that's also something to, to think about is like, essentially, like, if you're very like, short-term uh, sighted, you're going to be like, hey, uh, let, let's say I want to work on my checkout page or on my product page because uh, that's what's going to produce the best short-term results, which is great. But you also want to like, make investments for the long term to figure out, like, hey, like, can, how can I, uh, essentially, like, the unboxing experience, like, how can I make sure that experience is as good as possible so that like, customers uh, come back afterwards? Uh, and uh, by the way, there's a, a great book on the topic by uh, Tony Fadel, who's the guy who built the, the iPhone. And he talks about like, each of the steps of the, of the customer experience and like, 
for example, like they were building the, the nest, you might have like those thermostats, and they were like doing a lot of research on like when you unbox your nest, like people were stuck because they didn't have a screwdriver, so they were like, oh shoot, <laughs> what do I do? And, uh, and so that part of the customer experience was broken, and uh, it's not like they optimized the product page or anything else, so they, like, they just learned that they need to have a screwdriver with the product, and, uh, and that the customer experience got better, like people use their nest more and then talk about it more on, uh, on certain parties. So, that's the, I think, the core beliefs we have on uh, how you can leverage customer experience to, uh, to grow your business. And then um, what we've done is we've essentially tried to size a bunch of tactics to figure out like, what is it that you can do today to increase your GMV by making the customer experience better. So I want to talk about a few of them. Like we worked on a, uh, actually a, a few more, but uh, I'll, I'll give you like the, the high level of like things that uh, if you want tomorrow, you can implement with your business. All right, you ready for this? Let's, uh, so let's talk about the tactics. So number one, uh, these tactics come from Glagnetic, uh, which is uh, an eyelash company. Uh, they are uh, in Florida and here in LA. And one thing that they do really well, you see like they're pretty popular on social media, like half a million followers, is that they welcome all the subscribers to the brand and uh, say, hey, like, thanks for following us, like, welcome to uh, our brand journey, and then they introduce themselves. And so that essentially like, gives this human touch. That's something you can do from the, the back office of uh, Instagram, for example, if you want to do that. And that essentially like, helps you build like, your first step of the relationship with customers. And what's interesting about it is like, it's not only a cool idea, uh, when we look at the numbers from uh, Glamnetic and a bunch of other brands that have done that, is uh, you can lift your GMB by 4%. So essentially like, that increases the conversion from, uh, if you think of like, your Instagram page to your customers, you have a, that's a funnel, right? Because like, some of them are gonna buy, some of them are just gonna be aware of the fact that uh, the brands are there without buying. And so if you do that well, you get a 4% lift, uh, which I think is pretty good. Tip number two. <laughs> uh, so this one comes from uh, Chris uh, from CrossNet. They do these uh, games that you can see uh, here. Um, and so one of the things that's been interesting about them is that they, they are like big advocates of uh, having a chat on the website. So obviously that's a use case we, we know well uh, uh, at Gorgeous. So what we've done is like we, we were like, hey, like adding a chat is cool. Like I think like if you do a, a meeting internally, like everybody's gonna agree that uh, okay, like it's, it's good to have like direct conversations with customers. But the question is like, hey, like yes, but I need to hire. Like we spoke about BPOs earlier. Like that costs money. And so the question is like, how do you think about like is that actually worth it? Am I gonna drive GMV and uh, and revenue for the business with this? So what we've done here is that we um, essentially looked at hundreds of merchants. And we essentially try to find like what is the conversion of the chat of their website versus not having a chat. And so what we found is that you can get an uplift in website conversion by up to 13% on that chat. Uh, so that's also something that you can implement if you don't have a chat on the website, uh, essentially launching one and having an angle that is not just, a, hey, let me answer your questions, but more like help me guide you through uh, uh, like the, the funnel and to convert or to upsell or to come back that's a, a big opportunity to, to drive revenue. Uh, so that's our second uh, piece of advice here. Third one um, is uh, same on, on the support side. So one thing that we found is that we're sitting on these like uh, millions of conversations and uh, we're like, hey, we're gonna respond fast to them and well to them and that's gonna be uh, considered as a good job. Uh, but when you have more of a revenue approach uh, to these conversations, what you find is that the conversion of support conversations is typically like around like two or three percent by default. So that means like if somebody is going to email you like, "Hey, I have like uh, this question about this product," so you're going to answer that question, and then like if you take that in aggregate, you have like three percent conversion. And so what's interesting is like it's a, like a, a sleeping opportunity that's here and that like not a lot of people touch. And so we looked at that and we spoke with uh, some of our customers. So here is uh, Kayla Jackson. I don't know if she's here today. Uh, but one of the things they do really well is that they essentially consider the, the support team as sales associates. And so sales associates, I don't know if you've uh, had the experience to be a sales associate in a store, you learn a lot. Uh, but uh, one of the things that they, they have is that the compensation structure is based on sales. And so if you apply that logic to uh, your support team, you get, again, like a 1% GMV boost. 
So those are like small numbers, but essentially like we have like 20 or so tips like this. And so when you add that up, like you can essentially like grow your business by like 40, 50% by doing this well, which is uh, I think like pretty exciting. Um, next tip comes from, uh, yeah, the, the speed uh, at which you respond to your customers come from Joseph uh, from Timbuktu. They do backpacks, uh, again, up in, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and so what we found is that uh, there's, um, it's, it's quite interesting, like we have some people on our team who used to work uh, at Stitch Fix and they've done some research here on like figuring out like how fast do you want to respond to your customers and what is the impact of that on customer experience and then on like retention. And so what you find is that as long as you respond like fast to emails, meaning like less than six hours, you're in a good spot. And then at six hours, you see like this massive drop of like, hey, like people are going to be pissed and they're not going to come back. Because if you think about the, the previous chart on like the fact that we have 25% of people that have started shopping online often since uh, COVID, like these people, essentially they need to build a, a relationship with your business. And in the relationship, there is a, a trust component. And so the trust is like, hey, if I have some headache, I know they're going to get rid of my headaches. And they, that needs to be true. And so if you manage to make this true by addressing those headaches fast, then they're like, OK, there's a high chance I'm going to come back. So again, good, uh, good learning from looking at this, uh, the distribution of uh, retention post uh, resolution of support tickets. Last one, similar vein as well. Um, we have some customers asking us, like, hey, uh, some merchants asking us, like, hey, like, should I uh, strive for like, uh, what type of rating? Like, if you think about it, like as a, I don't know, like we, we have ratings everywhere in our lives. And so like, how much should you work to get your rating to be high? And uh, it turns out most people have a rating of four out of five uh, when it comes to, uh, to CX. And so what we found is that if you strive for like, getting that to 4.9, then you are in a much better spot in terms of retention because same story, you're gonna build the trust and, uh, and the impact on, uh, on conversion here uh, is 4%. So that means like, oh no, sorry, not conversion, GMV. So that means like you're gonna have people that are gonna retain better because they trust your brand more and then drive the GMV up. All right, so yeah, those were like five uh, of the learnings I wanted to share. Uh, again, like we built a playbook with like more of them. And if you're curious, um, we'll share this presentation in the, in the follow-ups. Uh, I know it's also on the, the Gorgeous website. You can just like Google this thing and you'll, you'll get on it. And so you see like a bunch of tips that you can uh, follow to, to lift the, the conversion of your, your, the GMV of your business. And, uh, and by the way, like, like personally, like as we build Gorgeous, like, uh, it's cool, obviously, to build a, a support platform that helps everyone like respond faster to the customers. But I think like what's even more interesting is to say, hey, like you all are trying to succeed with your business, and so we're trying to find ways that we can help you succeed. And uh, it's not just like responding fast or responding well; it's driving GMV. So like personally, and like with all the team here at Gorgeous, like that's the number one thing we care about, and like we spend a, a quite a bit of time on those things, like trying to figure out like what are the things that we should. Uh, uh, empower you to do so that you can drive more GMV. Uh, so if you have tips as well that work for you, I'm, I'm really curious because like, we want to broadcast them obviously to the whole ecosystem so that we, uh, we all win together. All right, that's it. Big thank you to uh, all of you. If you have uh, questions, feedback, uh, this is my email. Okay, we have three to five minutes before we break for lunch. As you guys know, the lunch is outside, but let's uh, take this opportunity to, to ask Romain a lot of questions. Like, uh, this is amazing content. Thank you, Romain, for joining us. Does anyone have any questions for Romain? Yes. Hi, I'm Melissa. I'm from um, Harper Wild. I love Gorgeous. Um, I'm obsessed with it. Uh, I started looking at the revenue statistics and being interested in understanding from a revenue driving perspective, what is, if you will, good revenue versus bad revenue, where if a customer is having to come to the site and we're having to unblock, right, um, a question, at what point are you looking at that as being able to say, okay, what percentage of the revenue did I drive was because we needed to unblock something, as opposed to maybe it's an engagement tactic that we provided the customer, and therefore, because of an engagement tool or because of a CX-driven initiative, maybe we followed up on a survey, um, we follow up on all feedback that we receive across all the platforms, and so that to me is, is good revenue being driven. And so are there ways that maybe in the future you're gonna be able to differentiate, right, um, something that we had to unblock, um, and therefore you wanna improve, um, whether it's on the site, whether it's a common question um, in 
I don't know, FAQ, what have you, um, versus how to help customer support say you, this was a proactive uh, approach to revenue and therefore that's, that's revenue we want to be driving. Thanks for the, the question. So I'm uh, at Gorgia, uh, we spoke about like having everybody at, at the company like know who the customers are and uh, essentially like so that you can use this knowledge to uh, make you, do your job better. And so at Gorgia, what we do is that we all, uh, all the managers are CSMs, uh, so customer success managers of merchants. And so what's cool is that I, I got this question a couple times from the merchants I, I manage. So Glamnetic is, uh, is one of them, like they're trying to drive the, the revenue. And, and so j just for everyone here on, on the contact side is that what you can do is measure how many dollars you're getting out of your support conversations. Uh, so you can do that by like taking like all the emails you, you're getting from support conversations, taking all the emails from sales, then have uh, an attribution window and then attribute some of the revenue. Uh, so we do that uh, in Gorgias um, in the statistics. And, and so, uh, yeah, to your point, like uh, attribution is by definition imperfect. And uh, I, I think that's uh, something we've discussed a lot internally. And so uh, I, I think there, there are a few ways to, to make it better. So uh, on the question itself, so you're saying like sometimes, yeah, we, we just like, it's, the customer is like just a little bit blocked, we unblock them, we get all the attribution, it's a little bit unfair, okay. So I think um, you wanna like essentially tag your conversations uh, so that you can track that. So I, I see a few tags that you can have. Uh, number one is, uh, we have uh, Glamnetic, uh, another version is Decathlon uh, on, the, on the West Coast here. Uh, what they do is that they tag conversations as leads. And so then uh, it's like whenever somebody asks a question, like, hey, like, is this bike good for, like, uh, I don't know, mountain biking, that type of stuff. Uh, and so this way they know that it's like essentially somebody who's at the top of the funnel and then they track the conversion from that funnel in particular. Uh, so I think this is good because, uh, first of all, you can have like interesting use cases that can be uh, uh, following up, for example. So if you know like every day I get 100 leads, uh, I should follow up with my leads because there's a high chance they convert. In fact, they convert at like 10% or so, so it's actually worth doing. Uh, but yeah, so you can have like, you can break down your revenue statistics. So like let's say last month you made like $50,000, like you can say, okay, like I have $20,000 from like following up with those leads and these people were asking product questions, so you actually help them. So I think the attribution model depends on like what you think is right, but like this one makes sense. Um, then you can tag the things that are like funnel blockers. So I don't know if that's a bug on the website or something like that. You can essentially like use the intense, the, the classification of messages to say, if uh, the issue is X, then I'm gonna add this tag. And so you break down your 50K and you say, okay, I have 20K of hot leads, maybe 10K of white side bugs. Uh, so I'm gonna like exclude those from the, the, the final attribution number because you know that they, they should not be uh, attributed. And then uh, one thing you can do as well is look at the upsell. So uh, you, you know like what's the AOV of your website and then you can know like what's the AOV of the cohort that engaged with your team on the chat. And you can see, okay, like maybe it's like $70 versus like $50. And so you see that there is a lift. So then correlation, causation, uh, that's uh, for, for you to determine. But at least you can say, okay, like we can see that that translates to, to, to a lift in, uh, in revenue. So you, you have like more, more information there. La last piece being, um, you have like the reorders. So for example, some buying, uh, some, somebody is gonna be like, hey, I bought something. Let's say I have a, a question about it or a problem. And then um, sometimes they're gonna buy again if they have a good experience or if you like make your product recommendation. And so you can also tag those as like post uh, sale, for example, and then you look at the conversion of your post sale conversations and then you see like, okay, like I'm able to drive this much conversion from these post sale conversations. And so yeah, I would essentially like take the number and then break it down using the tags. Uh, so that's something you can do today. Uh, that's also a good point on the, the future of, uh, I mean, the, the gorgeous product itself. So we, we're investing heavily on the, like tracking the revenue from conversations. And so I appreciate the feedback as well. Uh, I'll bring that to the team. Cool, we probably have one, one uh, time for one more question. And I also wanted to uh, clarify, I did say there's lunch right after this, but it's actually one more panel. So hold your appetites. There's one great panel coming up with Clavio after this. One more question for Romain before uh, we move on to the next panel. Yes, sir. From Higher Horatio, if you're looking for a BPO too, like we've got lots over here. Hey, really appreciate the, uh, the presentation. I think one question that I had for you while you're up here is we've obviously seen a lot of investment from you in, in revenue, in automations, in self-service, a lot of different features. We've been using Gorgeous for, for three or four years now um, with a lot of our merchants, but wondering 
what kind of the key new areas of investment you guys are, are seeing and any new exciting uh, product development that we should look out for in the near future? Revenue <laughs> is the high level answer. So uh, the, the, the philosophy comes from this actually, like it's like, sometimes it's like your, your story is your strategy. It's like what you tell to your team, it's what you tell to your customers, it's what you do in your product. And so I think like this is all the same thing essentially. So like that, that's literally like how we think about um, what we're gonna do the next few years. So I, I, I think uh, when I say I believe in those things like the, the, hey, like we need to improve the customer experience as a way to succeed long term. Um, I, I mean it like quite seriously, and so essentially, like what we're trying to do uh, in in the next few years is um, um, a couple of things. So one is, um, as a DTC brand, like one thing you do better than uh, probably like uh, Amazon or like the retailers in real life is that you know a ton about your customers, and so. I think what's, uh, that creates an interesting opportunity to say, hey, how can we make the customer experience as good as possible from uh, awareness to uh, when you talk about your experience to your friends? Um, and so that's something we want to do in the coming years is to say, hey, like we have all this uh, data from conversations. Like let's say you chat on the website, you mention you like bikes. Okay, like we can use that to improve the customer experience later on. Uh, so that's a... I'd say like the, the high level abstract answer is that like we want to use all the data that's available to make recommendations to merchants on how to improve the customer experience so that they grow as a business, not through these one time transactions, but through building good relationships. Um, so what that means in terms of, uh, in terms of product is, uh, is twofold. Uh, one is like we're investing more in the, the customer identity. So like Gorgeous has like 80 or so integrations at this point. Uh, we want to push that to like 500 or so, like essentially like get more data about the customers in one place so that when the support team is in the product, they can see, okay, like they open this email, they have this subscription, uh, they have this uh, return issue and so forth. So having like a full view of the customer. So that means like richer customer profiles with properties and events. And then in terms of use cases, we have those bricks. Uh, thanks for calling them out. So we have the help desk, we have the automation, we have revenue. Uh, so we're probably gonna add more bricks down the line on top, uh, leveraging this uh, customer profile so that you can have a, a better customer experience. W one thing we're pretty bullish on right now is to uh, uh, make sure you can have conversations with the most interested uh, prospects or leads that are on the website uh, so that, that they are guided, uh, they have like the, the white glove service that you, uh, you probably want to give them to maximize conversion. So that's like short term and like long term is the, the philosophy as you share. Thank you so much, guys. Big round of applause for Roman. Thanks, guys. <laughs>